I am Dr. Tiny Nair. I head the Department of Cardiology at uh, PRS Hospital, Trivandrum. Welcome to this uh, program, a CME on beta blockers in cardiovascular disease management. So here we take you through the handhold you and take you through the, the series of cardiac diseases that can be managed with beta blockade and go up to the present state of affairs in cutting edge research. So let's go straight away. If you look into the global prevalence data of cardiovascular disease, it is truly, truly mind boggling. With 17.9 million deaths in a single year, this data comes from 2021. So in the preceding one year, cardiovascular disease caused a mortality, a death of 17.9 million people worldwide. Right. But what is interesting is that 75% of these 18 million deaths occurred in middle or low income countries, like from where we come from, right? And that's why we are here to discuss. Now, who are these uh, low and middle income countries? It's we, right? Look at the data, India, Bangladesh, Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, Nigeria, and Pakistan, the so-called developing countries, we contribute to 50% of global population, 50% of world's population call this their home, right? And that's the very reason why we contribute heavily to this morbidity and mortality of cardiovascular disease. That brings us to the perspective. Now the point is, let us focus on India. So look at the Indian map of cardiovascular disease, you see there are some very interesting, disturbing data. For one, this is data from WHO, one fifth, which was 20% of cardiovascular disease related death globally take place in India. So one fifth of those deaths, cardiovascular disease related deaths happen in India. Now, if you look at the heat map of cardiovascular disease in India, on the left, you see the top and the bottom are red, which means the prevalence is significantly high. Yes, you can see the gross heterogeneity of cardiovascular disease all over India. You see blue, you see green, you see orange, and you see red. The states with the highest amount of CVD is Kerala, Tamil Nadu in the south, and Punjab in the north. Point number three is that in India, the age standardized cardiovascular death rates are far higher than the global standards. So the death rates are much higher in our population. Right? For example, the global death rate is about 235 per 100,000 population goes up to 272 per 100,000 population in India. So we have a higher prevalence, we have a higher death rate, and we have a gross in homogeneity. Right. Now, if we try to focus fast forward and look into the future, the true burden of cardiovascular disease in India by, let's say, 2030, look at the disturbing data. It's likely that we will have 5,200 people per 100,000 population, which is what? About 5%. Significantly high. Point number two, the life years that is lost, the productivity that is lost, either because of creation of morbidity or mortality, is extremely high. Right. And point number three, this to create a high economic burden. It's estimated that by 2030, the cost of cardiovascular disease in India, the management cost, would be a burden of 200 billion rupees. You know how much that is? 
that is 20,000 crores, 20,000 crores of Indian rupees. And these are mainly driven, this cardiovascular disease is mainly driven by high blood pressure, ischemic heart disease, and heart failure. And that is what brings us to beta blockade. Because beta blockade is FDA approved and is a drug of choice for many of the situations. For example, take hypertension. Today, we don't say that beta blockers are number one choice in hypertension. But in certain subsets as per the guidelines, for example, hypertension with angina, hypertension post MI, arrhythmias, LV dysfunction, AFib, or let's say a young lady who wants to be pregnant or is already pregnant, the safest drug for hypertension is beta blocking. So subsets of hypertension are there where there's first choice of a beta blocking. Point number two, heart failure, especially heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, what we call as HEF ref Point three, chronic coronary syndrome, or what we call as chronic stable angina. Post MI angina, beta blockade is a drug of choice. What about arrhythmias? Atrial arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmia prevention and sudden cardiac death prevention, beta blocker scores extremely high. So arrhythmias, chronic coronary syndromes, cardiac failure, and subsets of hypertension are situations where beta blockers are very clearly indicated. How do beta blockers act? Beta blockers act by blocking the beta receptor. That's why they main beta blockers, right? So basically all they do is to antagonize the effect of beta adrenergic stimuli. So they block the beta receptor, cut down the catecholamine levels, and benefit. Right. Now, when we look at beta blockade's effect, in the physiological sense, all that we need to remember is four important points. One, beta blockers reduce heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure, thus reducing the stress on the myocardium. So beta blockers reduce heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure. Point two, beta blockers reduce conduction velocity through the AV node. So as it slows down the AV node conduction velocity, the atrioventricular node is a refractory for a longer period of time. So it slows down heart rate, counters arrhythmias. Point number three, reduces cardiac contractility. And that's why force of contraction comes down, heart gets good rest, and we benefit in cardiac failure. But at the same time, at the same time, because it reduces cardiac contractility, we should be extremely careful when we start beta blockers in heart failure. Lastly, beta blockers exhibit direct antiarrhythmic and anti-ischemic effects. So reduction of heart rate, blood pressure, slowing of AV conduction, reduction of cardiac contractility, antiarrhythmic and anti-ischemic effects are the basic four mechanisms of action of beta blockade. Beta blockade comes in two basic varieties. One is called cardio-selective beta blockers, beta blockers which act more specifically, the beta-1 receptors, which are present in the heart, or non-selective beta blockers, which act on beta-1 and beta-2 as well. Beta-2 are situated in the lungs, in the peripheral vasculature, and quite a few other organs. So we would prefer, from cardiac point of view, a beta blockade which is beta-selective, because it would basically act on the heart and not have any other side effects. So which are those beta blockers? The beta blockers, which are beta-1 selective, are atinolol, metoprolol, bisoprolol, and nebivolol. Right. Atinolol, metoprolol, bisoprolol, nebivolol. Now, of them, atinolol tends to be water-soluble and doesn't really enter the central nervous system. And this lipid solubility gives the beta blockade an effect 
of prevention of sudden cardiac death. So ethanol is water soluble and does not tend to collect, to go into the central nervous system because they don't cross the blood brain barrier, which is a lipid rich membrane. Right. So if instead, metoprolol, bisoprolol, and nebivolol are beta 1 selective, at the same time, they tend to go cross lipid barriers, go inside the central nervous system and benefit by preventing sudden cardiac death. So today, from cardiac perspective, we tend to choose either metoprolol, bisoprolol, nebivolol. What you don't see in the list is carvedilol, which is not in the list because it is not beta 1 selective. Now, if we focus on metoprolol, why are we focusing on metoprolol? Because metoprolol is the kind of hallmark the first beta selective beta blocker to come out, right, which has profound benefits. So, for example, if you look at the pyramid of benefit, cardio selectivity on top and efficacy at the bottom, efficacy, yes, metoprolol has demonstrated efficacy and safety in almost every kind of cardiovascular disease where they are indicated hypertension, angina, heart failure. Okay, what about other actions? It tends to be lipid soluble and so. And so it has beneficial effects. At the same time, it has no what is called an intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. Many of the beta blockers, not the one you saw in the list, have something called an intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. And those ones have been shown not to benefit, not to benefit in the background of heart failure. Fortunately, metoprolol does not have intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, and it's Membrane stabil stabilization activity is also weak. What about safety? Because it is beta-1 selective, it is safe for patients with COPD and peripheral vascular disease. Metoprolol has a, has a relatively short life. The metoprolol tartrate has a short half-life that lets us tight it easily. But in the long run, we always prefer metoprolol succinate which is in sustained lease metropolog, which because of its sustained lease, what is called as XL, it has a long duration of effect. Lipid solubility. Metropolog is lipid soluble. And that, like we said, allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier and, and exert a central effect, reducing the central sympathetic drive, which partly explains its prevention of sudden cardiac death. What about Beta-1 selectivity, we know that metoprolol is beta-1 selective with minimal or no effect on beta-2 receptors. So you see, metoprolol kind of fits in right from the base to the apex of the entire pyramid of benefit from efficacy, patient safety, pharmacokinetic profile, lipid solubility, and cardio selectivity. Now that we know the cardiac conditions and beta blockers, let us individually take up the role of beta blockers, where we said they're indicated, and we obviously start with the commoners, that is hypertension, right? We know that if we look into the pathobiology of hypertension, it's pretty complex, right? But if we try to simplify it, you see on the left, you on the right, you have sympathetic nervous system, SNS, right? Simple, sympathetic nervous system. And on the left, you have the renin angiotensin system, these two the RAS system and the sympathetic nervous system are the major drivers of high blood pressure. And of course, you have what is called the blood volume right there, bottom left, and total peripheral resistance. So RAS system, sympathetic nervous system, blood volume, and total peripheral resistance. This forms the four corners and the four pillars on which the hypertensive therapy is based. For example, if you're looking at blood volume, diuretics, SGLT inhibitors, reduce blood volume. Right. Total peripheral resistance, calcium channel blockers, they vasodilate, reduce total peripheral resistance. But if you look at the central driving mechanisms, the major neurohormonal mechanisms for hypertension, one is renin angiotensin system, RAS. And RAS is inhibited by ACE inhibitors, ARBs and RNE. What is left is the sympathetic nervous system. 
And simple nervous system is what is innovated by beta blockers. And that's why when we talk about four major drug classes in hypertension, we talk about beta blockers, RAS inhibitors, diuretics, and calcium antagonists. But over the years, RAS inhibitors and calcium antagonists and diuretics has taken a kind of forefront in the guidelines of hypertension, restricting and downgrading beta blocking in very specific situations. For example, let us look at the ESC guideline 2018 for hypertension. The preference is to give one single pill. Why one single pill? That improves patient compliance. Patient of hypertension has no symptoms, right? He comes and says, doctor, I am fine. Why are you giving me a pill? And if you give him more pills, he's not likely to take them. So one single pill, a combination of ACE inhibitor or ARB with a CCB or a diuretic. And if that does not take care of hypertension, go for step two, where you have all three drugs, all three drugs together, ACRB, CCB, and diuretic in this one single pill. Did you notice that beta blockers are not there in the list? Yes, beta blockers are, as per the ESC 2018 guideline, downgraded to specific indications. And what are they? Patients who suffer from angina, patients post MI, patients with arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, patients with heart failure or LV dysfunction. And of course, younger women who are either planning pregnancy or are already pregnant because in pregnancy, one of the safest antihypertensives are beta blockers. Right. So if someone asks us today, what are the indications of beta blockers in hypertension as per the guidelines, they are one, hypertension with LV dysfunction, hypertension with angina, post MI, AFib, which all tends to come in the background of coronary artery disease. Women of childbearing age who plan to become pregnant or are already pregnant and they have hypertension, the safest drug is beta blockers. Heart rate control. If you have a person with hypertension and rapid heart rate, which we see commonly among young people who are highly stressed out, who generally work in the IT sector, have time-bound projects, extremely anxious, they do well with beta blocking. Then, of course, if you have comorbidities like migraine, portal hypertension, essential tremor, anxiety, thyrotoxicosis, where otherwise also beta blockers are indicated, you can write beta blockade in the background of hypertension. So those are the list, standard list of beta blockade in hypertension. But then if you look at the new data coming out, things are likely to change. For example, 2020, this data is from Costas Thomopoulos, and of course, you can see uh, Mansia, uh, who is the who is the president of the European Society of Cardiology now, is uh, he, he has written co-authored this uh, article where they looked into 84 BP lowering trials of them that took 67, involving 165,000 patients. So this data comes from 165,000 of patients. And at the end, this meta-analysis says beta blockers, beta blockers were associated with a lower incidence, lower incidence of major cardiovascular events. So it looks like beta blockers are coming up. They're good, right? They reduce major cardiovascular events. And as you can see, they are significant. They also tend to reduce all-cause mortality. And look at that hazard ratio in this analysis, 0 0.81, meaning 19% reduction of all-cause death. So in this meta-analysis, which is huge, beta blockers were associated with lower incidence of MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, and a 19% reduction of all-cause death. Right. Now, this is Indian data. This uh, large trial called the India Heart Study was done by, I was part of them, a uh, dozen of our colleagues were also involved. This was a huge trial where we looked into the blood pressure pattern of 18,918 Indian patients. 
This was published in the Journal of Human Hypertension in 2019. And what we found was truly astonishing. We found that the resting heart rate of the Indian population, Indian hypertensive, was at 83 beats per minute, which is faster than usual. And this data clearly shows that we are different from the Western Caucasian white population. Right? Our resting heart rates are faster. Let's not discuss about the reasons why it's faster, but Indian hypertensive today is accepted after this publication that have a fast resting heart rate. What drug reduces resting heart rate? Beta blockers. So are we going to see in the future a reversal of the algorithm, reversal of the guidelines, especially for the Indians? We have to wait and see. But the data shows that Indian hypertensive have a faster heart rate and that is something that as hypertensive specialists, we don't like at all. From hypertension, beta blockers in hypertension, let's go to heart failure. Heart failure is a different situation where beta blockers are very clearly indicated. About three decades back, in studies people found that if you look at the plasma norepinephrine levels on the left bar and the renin levels on the right bar at baseline in a normal person, and it is normal, and compare that to a person with heart failure in blue. You see, in heart failure, plasma norepinephrine catecholamines increase hugely. Plasma renin activity increases hugely. Right? So you know now why we use a beta blocker and an ACE or an ARB in heart failure. But the point is this. They also showed, this is three decades back, that if you look at the probability of survival of a patient with heart failure and look at the time elapsed in months in the x-axis. So the y-axis is survival, the x-axis is time elapsed. Now, if you take out the dotted line, the dashed line, where plasma non-epinephrine non levels were the highest, right, more than 800 picograms per ml, you see that is a group that does the worst they have the worst prognosis. They die quickly. The chance of survival is the lowest. So heart failure patients have a very high non epinephrine level. Catecholamines are high. The sympathetic system is overriding everything. And higher their non epinephrine level, worse is their prognosis. And that is what brings beta blockers into the, into, into, into the perspective, right? So what happens in heart failure? This is what happens in heart failure. You have increased sympathetic drive. You have increased renin angiotensin system. So we use, use a beta blocker and an S inhibitor or an ARB or an ARNI, right? Now, we should understand that this accelerated sympathetic nervous system creates a low threshold for right life-threatening arrhythmias. We today know that a large number of heart failure patients die suddenly because of a ventricular tachyarrhythmia. They have worsening of myocardial functioning over time. And of course, they have what we today call as left ventricular remodeling, the shape of the left ventricle changes. And what does beta blocker do in heart failure? One, it cuts down chance of arrhythmia. Second, it improves cardiac function. Third, it alters the remodeling, right? What is called as a reverse remodeling. So reverse remodeling, improvement of LV function and prevention of arrhythmias are the main three driving forces that benefits beta blockade in heart failure. Now, if somebody asks that, what are the effects of beta blockade in heart failure? The exact physiologic reasons, they're multiple. For example, first, heart rate comes down and the blood pressure comes down. So that the stress on the failing heart is far less at slower rate, lesser blood pressure. So the afterload for the heart is less. Beta blockers by its design inhibits renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Beta blockers improve the ventricular ejection fraction. Beta blockers improve 
left ventricular structure and function. If you look at the volumes, the end systolic volume, the end systolic volume, which is a matter of long term outcome, significantly comes down. Ventricular filling time is prolonged because the heart rate is slow. There is direct antiarrhythmic action of beta blockaders. Finally, it prevents long term myocyte damage because the circulating plasma non epinephrine is now down. And that prevents programmed cell death. Today, what we call as cardiac apoptosis. So apoptosis comes down, antiarrhythmic, ventricular filling time increase, uh, increases, the ancestolic volume decrease, cardi cardiac ejection, and fraction improve, inhibition of renal angiotensin system, slowing, slowing of heart rate, and lowering of afterload. Huge benefits of beta blocker in heart failure. Now, treatment with beta blocker, if you look at the guidelines, one, systolic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Understand that despite the theoretical possibility of worsening of peripheral vascular disease, presence of peripheral vascular disease today with the selective beta blockers like metoprolol, bisoprolol, and nebivolol is not a contraindication to, lower, to, to initiate or continue beta blockers. And that is a guideline recommendation. When to initiate treatment? At diagnosis, provided the patient tolerates and there is no contraindication, right? And finally, comorbidities. This is something that prevents the physician from not starting beta blockage, which we will take up in the next couple of slides. But understand, in the presence of atrial fibrillation, beta blockers slow down heart rate. In the presence of history of myocardial infarction, beta blockers are one of the finest drugs in prevention of cardiovascular events. So. A fib and history of MI makes it more important that we put the patient on beta blocking. Now we know that if we look into the drugs that reduce heart failure death in HFREF, drugs that reduce mortality are the ones that are most important, right? And that's why we today talk about Dalsatan or ACE inhibitors, you see the graph there, they bring down by 10 and 15%. MRA, by about 25 to 30% reduction of mortality alone. But when you put beta blockers in perspective, this is something that most people don't understand. The mortality individually itself comes down by about 30 to 35%, this relative risk of mortality. So beta blockers are one of those drugs that are best in improving survival in heart failure, right? And that's why you see that, that, that famous editorial in ESC Journal, which talks about the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four drugs in heart failure are beta blockers, RNE, SGLT inhibitors, and MRA. So beta blockers are extremely important in the treatment of heart failure. Now, how do we start? One has to be extremely cautious. You have metoprolol, bisoprolol, carvedlol, and nebivolol. In heart failure, these are Four drugs that have been tried in different trials of heart failure, right? Now, metoprolol needs to be in extended release form and metoprolol succinate and not tartrate, right? Now, the trick is you need to start on an extremely low dose. Otherwise, patient may not tolerate. So start, initiate therapy with a very small dose, 12.5 of metoprolol, 1.25 of bisoprolol, 6.25 or even 3.125 or carvedlol and 1.25 milligrams of nevivolol. So the trick is initiate very small dosage. Now this is a recent analysis which came this year. 25 trials, 95,000 patients trying to see the beta blocking benefit. Is it still persistent in an era where we have so many new drugs? Army, SGLT inhibitors, very sigward. Right, and the data clearly shows this. Okay, if you look at the trials, this is all-cause mortality, an extremely hard endpoint, right? If you look at all the beneficial trials, anything on the left of the straight line is benefit. So if you take out all the trials that show benefit of, beta of, of, of therapy in heart failure, every trial, what the name, had beta blockade in it. BB is beta blockade. So the very basis, the foundation of every heart failure therapy, whether you have added up ARNI, whether you have added up SGLT inhibitors, Verisiguat, or Macamtel, all the new drugs, 
the foundation is built upon beta blocker. There's been no trial that has shown benefit in the absence of beta blocking. So beta blocking forms the foundational therapy in the treatment of heart failure. Just two slides to look at arrhythmias. This is extremely important because most people fail to understand this. If you take patients of NYHA class 2, they are the minimally symptomatic heart failure. So you are looking at NYHA class 2 heart failure. This is data from Meditechev, long old data. You see that about 65% patients have sudden cardiac death. Of course, today therapies have changed. Sudden cardiac death has come down. But sudden cardiac death is a common mode of losing a patient who is mildly symptomatic. Sudden cardiac death needs to be prevented. And if you look into the drugs that are available for lowering risk of sudden cardiac death, ARB, beta blockers, MRA, and RNA. So we are looking at drugs that reduce apart from improving cardiac function and benefits, reduction of sudden cardiac death, you see beta blocker is the king, right? Compared to ACRB 20%, MRA 19%, RNA 22%, sudden cardiac death reduction is 40% plus with beta blocking. So that is where beta blocker scores. And that brings us to the last point of discussion, comorbidities. I think it's extremely important to understand because a lot of patients who actually would benefit from beta blockers don't get beta blockers. And that brings us to comorbidities. What are they? Well, of course, post MI. Today we know that that actually forms an indication for giving beta blocking. Peripheral vascular disease. We have clearly shown that the guidelines said whether you have peripheral vascular disease or not, don't withhold beta blocker if your patient needs it. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. A lot of physicians are inhibited in giving beta blockers in background of an asthma or a COPD, diabetes or obesity. We'll just touch upon COPD and obesity. Look at COPD. If you look at COPD, there's a huge data that comes from Brian Lipworth from the United Kingdom. And their analysis includes 5,977 patients of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Patients age more than 50, and they put them into two classic groups, right? You are looking at the x-axis is time in days. See, the follow-up goes to 4,000 days, right? So three, 10 years. And on the y-axis, you have survival. The blue line is beta blockers, and red dotted line, those who did not receive beta blockers. Very clearly, those who needed beta blockers and received beta blockers had a far better outcome, blue on top, survival better, with a relative risk reduction of mortality by 22%. So the moment you prescribe beta blocker to a patient who needs it, even in those with COPD, the relative risk reduction is 22%. What risk? Mortality risk is reduced, right? So we should prescribe beta blockers when indicated, but what's happening in real life? Look at this data. This is post MI. Like we said, there's a clear indication for writing beta blockage, right? Now, in COPD patients, the y axis is beta blockage usage. The light blue is COPD patients, and the dark blue is non COPD patients. Whether you are looking at 1995 or 2015, you clearly see that the usage of beta blockage in that blue line is significantly lesser compared to the dark line, right? So patients who actually need a beta blocker after MI, because they have COPD, a large number of patients even today don't receive it. And we are depriving them of the benefit of beta blockade here, right? So secondary prevention with beta blockade is underutilized. And that needs to be understood very clearly. Now, beta blocker therapy in COPD, this is one meta-analysis that looks into does actually beta blockers alter lung function? And they did it by looking into FEV1 or forced expiratory volume at one, right? So FEV1 gives us an idea 
where there is an obstruction or no obstruction. Right. So if you look at FEV1 and put all the selective beta blockers there, you see they are on both sides of a straight line. They don't really reduce FEV1 unless a particular person is extremely sensitive to beta blockade and develops bronchospasm on challenge with beta blockade. Most selective beta blockers don't alter FEV1 in an abnormal way or a detrimental way, right? So beta blockers are safe yeah, in, 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 in pulmonary disease overall, right? Finally, what is obesity? See, Indian society is changing, right? When we were young, most school boys used to be thin and slim. Today, look at our children. Most are overweight. So we are becoming a society of obesity, following exactly the Western food and the Western culture, right? So we are in a state of transition. Why are we talking about obesity here? Because if you look at what is called an MSNA, or muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which is actually a measure of sympathetic nervous system in a person. So you're measuring sympathetic nervous system activity in a person. The first graph is L, lean. It is what? It's about 30, right? If you look at peripheral obesity, it is green, it's about 45. But when you are looking at central obesity, look at that. The muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which is a marker of sympathetic nervous system activity, is significantly elevated. Now, this is something that many physicians fail to understand, which means you see an obese patient sitting opposite to you in your clinic. He is docile, he is quiet, he is sleepy because he doesn't sleep well at night. He might be having upset with sleep apnea. You always know that obesity, diabetes, so he needs a renin angiotensin inhibitor. Everybody knows that, right? But we fail to understand that his sympathetic system is overactive. So keep it in mind that for most obese patients, you have an exaggerated sympathetic nervous system. And if you look at the mechanism, that's a beautiful article, uh, a review of obesity-related hypertension. Look at that flow chart, obesity on top and hypertension bottom. So if you look into the real mechanistic connecting link, yes, we know that a renin angiotensin system is there. And we need to give him or her a renin angiotensin inhibitor, right? But understand that there is also a central increase in the activity of sympathetic nervous system. Right? Very interesting. Okay. And of course, you have OSA. So if you're trying to treat obesity-related hypertension, Keep in mind that you would need an ACE or an ARB to inhibit RAS system. Keep in mind that you would need a beta blocker to suppress this sympathetic nervous system activity. And try to think, do my patient have, is suffering from OSA? If so, he might need a CPAP. So RAS inhibition, beta blockade, and if needed, a CPAP for an OSA. Today forms the major three cornerstones in the treatment of obesity-related hypertension. Finally, is there an Indian data? Yeah, today we are proud to say that we do have, right? This is the Trivandrum Heart Failure Registry, which uh, we did in 2015 and managed to publish it in the American Heart Journal, right? Today, whenever we travel, we, we are always, oh, you did, you were part of the Trivandrum Heart Failure Registry, right? Uh, 1,200 patients, very meticulously followed up, Today, recently, we have published the five-year follow-up data. Almost every top journal in the world, right? Now, we've learned a lot of new things. For example, 62% of our patients have HEFREF, 38% have PEF. And the five-year mortality, the Indian figure is 50%. So heart failure mortality is 50%, extremely bad, right? But the point we are trying to show this data is because of this. When we looked at the five-year outcome data and tried to figure out what drove the five-year mortality, one thing that stood out was discharge prescription of beta blockers. And you see there, the hazard ratio is 0 0.55. What does it mean? That means if you had prescribed a beta blocker at discharge for your patient of heart failure, you reduce his five-year mortality by 45%. So just think about it. A mere prescription 
of a beta blocker in an indicated patient of heart failure reduces the five year mortality by 45%. But the bad news is here only about one third of our eligible patients got it. About 24% of our patients got GDMT, which means a combination of ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and an MRI. And one third got a beta blocker, which is bad news, right? So at the end of this discussion of beta blocker, what are we supposed to take home? In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, point number one, India has a huge burden of unseen cardiovascular disease. India has a huge burden of cardiovascular disease, which is often unseen. Beta blockers are effective in prevention, progression, and treatment of many cardiovascular diseases, including subsets of hypertension, including chronic coronary syndromes, including post MI, including heart failure, LV dysfunction, and many more. Specific hypertension subsets, like a young lady who is pregnant or wants to get pregnant, a person with LV dysfunction, a person who has arrhythmias, a person who has, who has features of heart failure, a person who has migraine, portal hypertension, tremor, anxiety, rapid heart rate, they are all subsets who would benefit by beta blockade. Heart failure, no question. HFREF, one of the four foundation therapies is beta blockade. And it is the king when it comes to reduction of sudden cardiac death. Chronic coronary syndrome, angina, post MI, cardiac arrhythmias, beaten AFib or a ventricular tachyarrhythmia, or prevention of sudden cardiac death. Beta blockers are very clearly indicated. And in sudden cardiac death prevention, again and again, we up this point, beta blocker is the king. Comorbidities are not a contraindication to therapy. So because your patient has little asthma five years back, now it's not there. Your patient has a COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis. They're not an absolute contraindication therapy with beta blockers. Neither are a peripheral vascular disease or any other chronic condition. So comorbidities do clearly evaluate can we still give a beta blockade? And why we are we, again and again talking about this is because beta blockers are grossly underused. Do prescribe beta blockers to a patient who actually needs it. Finally, finally, knowledge is like paint, right? Knowledge is like paint. So it is, it does no good until it is applied. Until this knowledge translates to a patient who is sitting in your clinic opposite to you tomorrow. Thank you for your time and attention.